home to 71 different species of mammals, Montana's Glacier National Park hosts a variety of some of our planet's most magnificent creatures. Ranging from herbivores such as bighorn sheep, white-tailed deer and moose, to predators such as wolverines, mountain lions, wolves, and of course, the mighty grizzly bear. It was these very grizzlies of Glacier that 43-year-old wildlife photographer Buck Wild had been most keen on snapping pictures of. Well aware of the potential dangers that an encounter with one could pose, Buck would always be sure to take every safety precaution necessary whenever he'd go camping in grizzly country, and furthermore knew just how much respect these massive and incredibly powerful creatures command. On the morning of October 3rd, 1992, Buck had just finished setting up camp at the Glacier Granite Park backcountry campsite. As he prepared breakfast that morning, he catches a fleeting glimpse of a small bear, followed by woofing sounds from what sounded like a much larger bear coming from the brush. Ensuring his campsite was free of food and any other potential bear attractants, Buck then quickly grabs his camera and begins following these bear tracks up a loop trail. Buck suddenly comes to a halt when he notices a blue baseball cap on the ground. Just a few meters from the cap was a tripod with no camera on it. The camera was instead neatly placed in its bag near the red backpack on the ground. Feeling uneasy with what he was seeing, the cautious photographer then heads back down the trail for about 30 feet and once again comes to a halt when he notices a still warm, foot-wide pool of blood on the ground. Realizing that something terrible must have happened, Buck's senses then heighten thanks to a sudden surge of adrenaline, at which point he continues backing down the trail. It doesn't take long before Buck notices yet more blood on the trail, but this time, there was a lot more blood, accompanied by grisly claw marks in a patch of dirt that looked as if it had been swept clean by a body. Or in other words, like someone was ragdolled all over it. With his eyes scanning for more clues of what he suspected was a brutal grizzly bear attack on a human, Buck cautiously continues down the trail, and just a few steps later, freezes on the spot when he this time notices not just more blood, but pieces of human flesh, scraps of clothing, and some coins, all of which were scattered all over the ground. Noticing a trail of blood, a horrified Buck equipped with bear spray, an item which had once saved his life from a charging Kodiak bear, decides to follow the trail of blood into the woods. Knowing very well that this attack was recent and that there was a chance that this person was still alive and could potentially still be saved. As he continued to follow the trail of blood, it didn't take long before Buck would notice more torn up clothing, a boot, and then finally, a man lying motionless on his left side. A horrified Buck observed that his body had been mutilated from head to toe with a large amount of flesh missing from one of his arms as well as his buttocks. Buck quickly kneels down to check the man's pulse, at the same time noticing that the blood oozing out from him was dark, something that typically happens when someone dies. Fearing the worst when he fails to detect the pulse, Buck then realizes that the man may already be dead. But despite his assessment, and once again based on his experience and plethora of knowledge regarding bear attacks, was also still aware that this man could be saved considering the warm temperatures of his body as well as that of his blood. Knowing just how precious every passing second was at this point, Buck runs back out to the trail and heads back for his backpack to grab his coat, which he intended on covering the man's body with to aid in keeping it warm. About two to three minutes later, a huffing and puffing Buck would arrive back to the spot he'd found the man's body at, only to see a huge smear of blood on the ground where it laid, and a trail of dark blood leading into deeper woods. It's important to note that the estimated 1300 grizzlies at Glacier National Park are part of the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. This is one of two large ecosystems that feature grizzly bears in this particular part of the country. The other major one being the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, which in comparison consists of approximately just 700 grizzlies. The reason this is important and relevant to this story is because unlike the much more well-fed bears of the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, the grizzlies that inhabit the Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem have to work much harder for their food, which means that these grizzlies are particularly much more aggressive when it comes to defending a carcass especially during hyperphagia, which is the scientific word for the period during which they fatten up for winter hibernation, the very same state that the mama grizzly was in when she attacked the man in this story. It's also worth mentioning for those that aren't aware that grizzly bears are a physical force to be reckoned with. Not only do they feature one of the most powerful bites in the animal kingdom, but they furthermore possess up to 5 inch long razor sharp claws and can reach running speeds of up to 35 miles per hour despite their massive size. Attributes which no question make these highly territorial apex predators some of the most formidable of their kind. 
equipped with this knowledge, Buck wisely decides not to follow the trail of blood, and instead walks down the trail a bit and leaves his bear spray on the ground, with a small note attached to it which read, Hey, get out of here, as well as instructions on how to use the bear spray in case they needed to. The thoughtful 43-year-old then walks up to the Granite Park Chalet so he could alert park rangers of the incident. Upon arriving at the chalet, Buck runs into some hikers, and upon telling them about what he'd seen, he thereby advises them not to walk the trail and instead walk back towards Logan's Pass, take the Highline Trail out, and then of course attempt to flag down some rangers. Buck then writes yet another note, this time for the park rangers, which read, Help! Discovered signs of bear mauling about a quarter to half mile downhill from chalet backcountry campsite. Followed another quarter mile and found body. He was in bad shape, but still alive. Went back to get coat to cover him, and body was gone. Met these people at the chalet. I plan to stay here for two reasons. One is to turn people back towards Logan Pass, and two is to make sure that National Park Services are alerted about the incident and where I saw the victim last. Signed, seriously, Buck Wild. Buck then gives the note to the hikers and asks them to get it to the park rangers as fast as they could. He then heads back up to the chalet where he'd keep watch from the deck with his binoculars for grizzly bears or even other hikers that could possibly come up the trail. A couple of hours later, two rangers, flown in via helicopter, arrive at the chalet. They inform Buck that some hikers had alerted them upon running into a can of bear spray, the very same one of course that he'd left near the trail where he initially found the man's body. Longtime ranger of the park Charlie Logan and his associate then briefly interview Buck about the specifics of what happened. And just minutes later, the rangers load their shotguns with heavy slugs and ask Buck to guide them down the trail toward the body. Upon arriving at the spot where he'd last seen the man's body, Buck then points out the dark bloody trail leading into the deeper woods. As the men cautiously follow the trail of blood, they travel just about 350 feet or so before spotting the man's body which Buck immediately noticed was clearly further fed on, as even more chunks of flesh were missing from his torso than when he'd first encountered it. The men then take note of the dirt which had been spread all over his body, which is typical grizzly carcass caching or storing behavior, and an effective one at that, as covering the carcass with dirt would help mask its scent from other predators. Knowing very well that this bear was definitely not finished and is most likely close by, the rangers then go on high alert and after jotting down some quick notes, they head back to investigate the scene where Buck had found the backpack and the camera. Upon arriving, the rangers commence what was to be a quick investigation, and as they noted down their findings, the enormous mother grizzly suddenly shows up, and immediately makes a bluff charge up the trail toward the three men, which was of course a display of intimidation in an attempt to protect her cubs, who were also not very far away behind her, and visible to the men as well. With his shotgun beat on the bear, Ranger Logan thinks to himself in his mind that if this bear takes even one step closer, he'd shoot it. And as if she could read his mind, the mighty mother grizzly wisely turns around, collects her cubs, and disappears into some thick brush. It was at this point that the men realized just how dangerous the situation was. And so the trio head back to the Granite Park Chalet in order to come up with a plan. The next day arrives. The men call for a search and rescue copter which was to arrive early in the morning but would not show up until 11 a.m. due to visibility risks associated with an unexpected heavy snowfall. It didn't take long for the helicopter pilot to spot the grizzly which had been feeding on the man's carcass. He also noted the collar marking on the bear which Buck and the rangers had told him was one of the suspect grizzly's main identifying characteristics. Logan then orders a total of six rangers to be dispatched to retrieve the man's body a unit which would include himself, as well as the ranger he'd initially met Buck at the chalet with. Five rangers were to make their way to the body on foot, and the sixth ranger was to keep overwatch with the helicopter pilot and look out for the bear. As the five ground rangers close in on the body, the copter ranger suddenly alerts everyone as he notices the grizzly from above. He then shouts to the pilot to fly over the bears and make close passes over them to scare them away from the carcass. Despite their efforts, however, the bears were still not showing any signs that they were intimidated. Despite multiple close overhead flybys, the grizzlies would do nothing but briefly run away for a few seconds and then abruptly turn around and head back towards it. The fact that these bears were unwilling to flee from even the roaring sound of a low flying helicopter was at this point a clear indication to the rangers that these grizzlies were not going to let anything get in between them and this carcass. 
After multiple more close overhead flybys, the Copter Rangers finally succeed in scaring the bears off. And within about 20 minutes of doing so, the man's body was then loaded up into the helicopter, after which a thorough investigation would take place to try and piece together what had happened. Investigators would later conclude that the man had likely surprised the mother bear, who then neutralized him in an effort to protect her cubs. After which, of course, it would turn from a defensive attack to a predatory one. The man's body was later identified as 40-year-old John Petrani from Madison, Wisconsin. John shared a home in Madison with his father, also named John, an avid biker and a lover of jazz music. John would also spend three weeks a year exploring and venturing out into the western wilderness. On this particular year, he'd spent the first part of his yearly trip in the Canadian Rockies before making his way to Glacier. Tragically, it was later found out that the day that John was attacked and killed was in fact the last day he'd planned on staying at Glacier before heading back home to his father. It would take a total of nine days for the rangers to find the suspect mother bear and although it was a hard decision for them to make, they would thereafter decide to shoot and kill the mother grizzly and its cubs, stating that she was likely to prey on other hikers considering how easy of a kill John was, and feared that if they'd let the cubs survive, they too would of course inevitably learn and adopt their mother's hunting tendencies. Final reports of the incident indicated that rangers were still not 100% sure if the mother bear and the cubs they'd taken down were the culprits responsible for John's death. <laughs> 